that um, this session is going to be streamed live on the internet, so people will be logging in with this discussion to be able to see and hear you. So as you make your intervention, please project your voice. I don't think we have mic. We have a cable mic, but we take it off as we need to do so you really, really need to speak up. So people online will be only be able to see the videos. to press the switch and we'll go online. Thank you very much, everyone. And if you need to leave and get some food, please feel free. There's a lot of food outside. Well, welcome um, to all of you again, and also welcome to our online community. Uh, I just wanted to uh, summarize where we are and uh, where we're uh, where we're going. So this morning um, we met into met in our uh, small groups, private sector, the group that looked at mining and delinking it from the war economy, and the third group that looked at how um, corruption can be addressed and eliminated. Um, so we have deliberated in our groups on those three issues. And each of us um, have come up with a set of recommendations um, on, and we focused on what the diaspora can do within its capacity to address each of those um, three issues. And so what I would like to do uh, now is um, turn it over to um, our representatives from each of those three groups that will um, brief us on what was said and more importantly, what the recommendations are. But I also wanted to remind our online community that um, they can still send us questions and comments as we, as we um, go on. We have um, six uh, bloggers and, uh, who are monitoring the um, online um, community, so we will get your um, views across. Uh, with that, I think I'll just um, turn it over. We will start with um, the uh, private sector group. And if you could uh, just, I'm sorry, the mining, the mining. mining group, mining. sorry. And if you could just identify yourself for the benefit of those who may not have been here this morning as well as the online community and then um, go on to summarize your session. Okay, thank you. My name is Kitenge Ngambwa and I am from the Congo. Um, our group looked at the mining, um, conflict in uh, Eastern Congo in particular, even though we uh, talked about some of the issues um, that uh, have affected uh, Shekamin, which is in Lubumbashi. In looking at the mining problems in the Congo, we uh, talked about the fact that it's a problem that has to be looked at from a two-pronged perspective. One is a political uh, angle to it. Uh, and the other, of course, uh, is the economic um, aspect of the mining conflict in the Congo. Um, the reason why we thought that we needed to talk, uh, to look at both um, um, angles is that without a viable government, uh, there is no uh, long-term solution to that problem. Uh, corruption, of course, uh, came up time and time again, and uh, the need to create a political system that um, then yields a government that is accountable to the people uh, becomes becomes paramount. Uh, but as a preface to our discussion, uh, Professor Kabamba uh, gave a, a historical perspective as to who the players um, in the region are at the moment. And uh, he identified about five groups. Uh, as we know, the FDLR is one of them the CNDP, um, the Congolese Army, 
uh, Monuk, which is the United Nations um, forces in the Congo. Uh, he also uh, talked about the North traders, and there is some degree of interconnectedness among those different forces. Uh, the semblance of peace uh, in Eastern Congo in that region uh, has to do with the fact that neither one of those forces is stronger than the other, and so they balance out uh, each other. So no one is stronger uh, than the other, so no one can defeat uh, the other, the other guy or the guy next door. So that is what seems to have created the semblance of peace that seems to exist, uh, or seem, seem to be perceived, if you will, in, in uh, Eastern Congo. Um, in, in talking about ways to go about resolving uh, some of the, these very, very complex uh, questions, we looked at uh, what um, Secretary Clinton um, talked about during her visit in the Congo in August. And um, one of the things she talked about was the need to go back to the root cause of the conflict in the Congo. And our group is of the view that it is important that we capitalize on uh, the administration's goodwill, if you will, to uh, work towards um, a more durable solution to the, conf the conflict in the Congo. So that, that was part of our recommendations in terms of ways to uh, resolve uh, the situation regarding mining. A number of questions were raised uh, relative to this uh, situation, and one of which was to the extent that all the uh, militia that are operating there um, or, or the companies that are doing business there were to stop operating in that region, would that put an end to the war? Uh, and answers were, were diverse. There were people who thought, yes, uh, that could, in fact, help to uh, stop the war. But there are those who also thought, no. Uh, I think we have to look at the bigger picture and address the real cause uh, of the situation in order for a lasting peace uh, to be created. We also talked about the need uh, for looking at the establishment of a regional, a regional structure uh, whereby um, different countries in the region uh, can work together uh, and create a more legal uh, interaction in, in the area of mining. In talking about the regional uh, structure, we went back to a model that, uh, that existed in the past, the, the CPGL, for those who know about the Congo, a little bit know about that. And even in proposing that we look at that model and try to revive it uh, now, we, were, um, we went back again to the political climate in the Congo. Uh, and that is, even if we were to be able to bring back uh, you know, structures or paradigms such as the CPGL, the, making, the makers of laws in the Congo today remain corrupt, uh, and so nothing is really going to work unless the political situation in the Congo is dealt with. And a lot of the speakers uh, were quite adamant to the need for the participation of the U.S. government in helping the Congo create a government that is legitimate, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Part of the other uh, recommendations with regard to the political dif uh, difficulties in the Congo was, again, to get the U.S. government to, uh, to tell, basically, uh, Rwanda and Uganda, which have been um, the middle countries in the export um, of uh, minerals from the Congo, uh, to basically stop interfering uh, in the internal affairs of the Congo. One of the other recommendations that was made uh, was with regard to how to put an end to uh, illicit mining, uh, suggestions were made to the, f to the fact that if the companies that are doing business in the Congo today were to help revive uh, companies that existed in the past and as a result employ more Congolese, that could be one of the ways to go about uh, addressing that problem. And uh, in the process of coming back to help the Congo uh, revive its mining uh, industry, the, the terms of reference as far as the contracts are concerned have to be absolutely clear to the fact that part of the contract has to do with training, in fact, the transfer of technology to the Congo. 
so that at the end of a, say, a 20 year uh, agreement with the Congo, the company that came to invest there uh, can begin to, uh, to exit, but at the same time, uh, human resources have been put in place for Congolese themselves to take charge of their, their minds uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the future. One other recommendation that was made, and we, we did recognize the fact that uh, the Congo is different from South Africa, but I think we did uh, bring uh, the parallel uh, between the Congo and the apartheid regime of South Africa, and the kinds of pressure that were uh, put to bear on companies which were, dealing which were doing business with South Africa at the time uh, as a way of, in fact, dealing with companies which are doing business in Congo today in a way that is detrimental uh, to the people of the Congo. Um, so those were some of the things that our group uh, talked about, and I will you know, refer to my, my colleagues in the group uh, if there are things to be added or, or, or corrected for that matter uh, for them to, to, to jump in. Thank you. Um, should we go to questions now, or? Uh... No, no, we just Oh, okay, yes. sorry, yes. Uh, I think what has to be made clear is that we demand that uh, the United States ask Rwanda and Uganda and their surrogates to leave Congo. To leave Congo. <coughs> which is a region in the Bangundu, Angola has to move out and return to the border that was left uh, as, a, uh, as independent through the colonial time. So these issues are raised. And uh, we say that given the weakness of the government and competence, elections in the Congo will be a farce because lack of security the fact that there is so much corruption, it's not going to be a conducive environment for holding good corruption, uh, good elections, in order to make the reforms that we are proposing in regard to the mining sector. Because it's big, big corruption still mm -hmm. in the mining sector. Are there others from the um, mining group that want to add? Yes. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, if you could just identify <laughs> yourself. Um, we, on mm -hmm. the I mean, uh, from Congo, we also point out the fact that uh, for those multinationals who are today exploiting illegally mineral resources of Congo, they should pay some damage, fine, if you want, or tax to be collected and make a, trans a trust fund to be used to finance humanitarian program in Congo. And this money has to be managed by a special agency not given to the corrupt government of Congo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, et la constitution et le, le code minier du Congo qui, est, qui sont très nocifs pour le Congo et pour le peuple congolais. 
maybe can someone translate? We don't have translation yeah, services. I, I can. I, the, the, the constitution, and the mandate of the Man, codes, which are very nocive for the population of Congo. Okay. Any <laughs> other comments? I want to go to our online community to see if we have comments from. Not from on the, the mining section yet. Not on the mining section yet. No. Okay, Sasha. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> Sasha Lejna for, represents a grassroots reconciliation group. Sure. Our discussion was uh, very good. Uh, um, a good dialogue about this issue, and uh, also wanted to inform those who are not uh, uh, were not in our, participating in our group that my organization with the Enough Project is trying to uh, help um, advocacy on this issue, particularly relating to the minerals uh, that are uh, mined in the conflict area and how they are used in electronics, uh, cell phones, and laptop computers. And so our session was very useful to help uh, input into the kind of campaign that uh, we are helping doing and we uh, look forward to continuing dialogue with uh, all of the diaspora groups uh, as we move forward on this issue. We are just starting our campaign and try to uh, help. The aim is of course to help the resolve the conflict in the East uh, and so one of the ways to build awareness and attention for that issue is through the conflict minerals uh, issue. So we look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm very sure that all of you see where you're intertwined at this point. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is that all the three of people represent what you've been said, so that after that you can go to the Q&A, because I'm sure they're all going to. Yes, we were just getting um, input from other members of the mining sector group. Um, but if, there, if we can go on now to the private sector. Um, um, good afternoon. I'm Angelique Mutombo Davis, um, Executive Director of BPIA and also wearing the Anavan Congo hat. Um, my group uh, consisted of nine people and we talked about um, strengthening the private sector. Um, our discussion was really lively and uh, we, we, we first started uh, with um, talking about challenges and identifying what the private sector is, who's, who, who makes up the private sector. And um, we basically um, broke it down into four different groups. The informal sector or semi-informal, which was um, the mom and pops doing business every day on the streets. Um, large corporations, um, the parastatal and, uh, or mixed co corporations, so it's uh, privately owned as well as uh, government owned and also the illegal sector, which is what, you know, um, un, um, registered groups doing business. Um, so those were the four groups. And some of the challenges that we identified, what, especially for diasporans living here and going back to do business in the Congo, was that um, there wasn't really a, a, a welcome atmosphere for, for, for us, or at least the feeling was that, um, the lack of infrastructure made it, you know, basic infrastructure made it really difficult for people to go back and do business. Also, just providing basic needs for populations abroad, like passports and, and um, things like that, made it was, was a barrier. It was, it was a big challenge um, for, for, for us. Uh, also, just even the, the infrastructure at the airport, you know. Um, putting together a welcoming environment, you know, having things that work at the airport, knowing where to go and all that. Um, one of the group members, you know, talked about how, you know, you go back to your own country and kind of have to have somebody come and get you at the airport because you don't know um, the, you know, the way to, the ins and outs of the airport and other public offices. Um, so th those were some of the challenges. And we also identified some workflow issues uh, with the government um, that people who were investing wouldn't really know. There was a breakdown in finance, in the finance system, justice, the regulation, taxes, security, infrastructure, um, banking, tariffs, labor laws, and just um, just inaccessibility to, to, to the information. I think um, we talked about there being like 32 different taxes um, imposed on people trying to do business in Congo and the fact that Congo was uh, number 181 uh, um, 
on a list of 183 countries, uh, worst places to do business. Um, so, you know, that should, that, that's really telling. And um, so one of the things that um, we said, we, we, we said uh, was that we needed to have um, a better link between entrepreneurs and um, the banking system. We also uh, thought that you know we should have set taxes and a clear roadmap on how to set up a business, um, have clear property rights, um, also uh, invest in connectivity and um, have access to information for people who are trying to set up business in the Congo. Um, one of the main points that came out of the discussion was that uh, we realized that Congolese are really entrepreneurial, and um, without that entrepreneurial spirit, Congo would not exist. Uh, and I think that needs to be highlighted, um, that you know, your regular Congolese person you know, is entrepreneurial, otherwise they cannot survive. Um, some of the recommendations we came up with was that um, we should uh, think about forming groups here in a diaspora, kind of like cooperatives, to work and invest in the Congo. Um, another recommendation was um, that the government be more transparent and accountable to the tax revenues that they receive. Um, also, we <coughs> talked about um, those of us here becoming more active, actively um, involved in the economy over there. I think we all send remittances back, you know, to family or to start businesses, but I think we need to become more active because we have something to bring to the table. Um, also becoming more vocal about policy um, and pol giving policy recommendations so that the, the environment in the Congo is, 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 is improved. Um, Another recommendation, uh, which wasn't fully discussed but was brought up, was uh, of perhaps creating a, a stock market. And um, some of the next steps we would like to see following this, um, this um, discussion today is me putting together a symposium um, or practical workshops um, to figure out where we can find resources um, to invest in the Congo. Maybe working with uh, donor agencies as well uh, as other organizations working in the Congo um, to bring them together, to bring everybody together to kind of discuss how we can reinvest the money that, um, that their corporations are getting and that um, donor agencies are giving to the Congo to, to, to uh, effectively work together. And also that when the, um, donor agencies are looking for um, technical assistance that they tap into the African diasporans living here, not just, you know, the usual suspects that they, they hire, but look at uh, um, cut nationals from the countries they're working in to, to work in the Congo. Um, um, so those were the things we brought up. I'm hoping that other members of my group can um, add to whatever I probably missed. Anyone from the mining group? I'm sorry, private, private sector, sector private group? Sector. Everyone's, yes. Okay, we also underline the fact that uh, we should look at ourselves as uh, being part of the problem, so we need also to be part of the solution. Uh, the whole community, Congolese community, has invested in us through education. Uh, we cannot only look at you know, the generals and the politicians as being the problem. Uh, we need to make sure we, we can bring our entrepreneurial spirit out with ideas and uh, actually uh, start small businesses. And then uh, work with others, uh, use our know-how to work with, uh, with others and um, create that link that is missing between uh, the informal sector and the uh, capital. Uh, so very good. Anyone else from private sector? <coughs> so, uh, there is only one point that I, I, I did, uh, we did uh, insist on the necessity of uh, the, the fund, the finance to finance uh, the private sector, uh, taking it uh, from the informal level in which we are, just to remind that Congo is a 60 million people, the same size like France or the United Kingdom 
just a, a huge market. So we cannot try to use those small solutions that are brought by the Congolese abroad. We recall that the Congolese send in less than 10 years, we run from 600 million per year Western Union transfer to 1 billion two or three years now, and we are over 1.5 billion of money sent back home. This is not what will really create the development of Congo. So we tap in the, our natural resource reserve, 23 trillion reserve of gold known and unexploited. So this can be coming to back up a state bond on one of our group just issued the idea to say we need a five billion investment for each province multiplied by 26 that makes the 140 billion project that we launch on the hair to make a kind of uh, Marshall plan since we went through a 10 years uh, 10 years war that cost us six million people really the world need to take this step to bring to rebuild the country with a very aggressive project of 140 billion and uh, people we hope the United States can take the lead on that with all the G20 and the Belgium to take over the five billion uh, project to rebuild infrastructure, school, education system, road to connect the country and connect the South Africa to Western Africa by crossing the DRC. Others from the um, private sector? <coughs> okay, I'm going to turn to the corruption group. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amani Luanzo. I'm a member of Congo Voices. And um, I think it's important to um, point out that the zero tolerance for corruption um, title doesn't have to do with the ca prison Kabila zero tolerance um, campaign. This is um, something different. This is, um, so it doesn't have to do with the, so we're not going to comment on his campaign, but on corruption in general in the Congo. Okay, um, the first thing we did was um, try to define what corruption is. Um, the group differentiated between grand corruption and petty corruption. And, um, and we realized that petty corruption is usually a function of low wages, um, lack of minimum wage, impunity, and it's like a form of survival. While grand corruption is encouraged by the system, it's also, it feeds into the expectations of people. It's also um, maintained due to the lack of transparency and job security that some top government officials have and um, the lack of repercussions for um, engaging in corruption. Um, the next thing we did um, was we looked at the different, um, the cost of corruption. What is corruption costing the Congo? Um, politically, corruption undermines the government. It makes the government um, weak and in inefficient because um, money that the corruption is supposed, to, um, the money that the government is supposed to collect, um, the government does not collect it because it goes into individuals' pockets instead of into government coffers. Um, and we also mentioned the fact that politically, um, we view political institutions as, an, as a source of access to wealth and not um, to serve the population, which is a problem. Socially, what corruption costs to um, the DRC is um, there is a problem of insecurity. The fact that instead of um, the military getting paid, um, they are not getting paid, so <coughs> they don't do their job to protect civilians. It's, there's also a cost um, in the humanitarian development because in order to the different international agencies that are operating and assisting the Congo, they have some of the money is diverted. Money that could be used to help the population is diverted into paying for the informal costs or um, unaccounted costs for actually being present in the Congo. 
and also it's um well yeah and short changes the government and economically the cost of corruption um, increases the cost of doing business in the Congo decreases um, foreign investment decreases the engagement um, with the outside world because of the um, difficulty of importing um, countries into the um, importing products into the country and um, we also discussed um, a few recommendations that the diaspora could do to address corruption in the Congo. Um, the first thing we came up with as a recommendation was to denounce corruption, um, denounce corruption in our different host countries and to talk about it in the media, um, over the net with each other to have to keep this discussion going. And also um, another, um, uh, something else that came up that I think is important to mention is oftentimes the diaspora is kind of seen as the opposition to the government that's in power. And we said it's important that we foster um, an image of being the civil society where we applaud positive things that the government is doing as well as the bad things so that we can also be credible when we raise our voices against um, anything we feel is going wrong in the Congo. We also um, realize that significant change has to come from within Congo. So we have, to do, we have to identify what is being done within the Congo by the civil society there and by others and see ways to support the different actions. And also, um, we also have to demand accountability um, at the level of our host countries because we know since um, most of us are living in the Western world and a lot of um, our host countries provide aid to the Congo and there are laws in the United States for example um, against doing business in a corrupt country we demand that these laws be implemented and taken seriously. Um, I'm sure I might have left something, so I don't know, maybe the members of my group can add anything. Members of the corruption group? Uh, I, I think we'll <coughs> start with um, uh, one issue of looking at the corruption at, at all levels. We mean from looking from the small guy in the street to uh, the office of the president. I mean, the way we do it is uh, looking at that issue is to uh, look at the direct various way of addressing uh, it in a very effective way. And so what we, we discussed was uh, if, if, if there is an anti-corruption committee in what, which is created, um, if that commission has also a problem or is, uh, uh, is made up of people who are, are corrupt, then there is to have a system uh, within the country which looks at uh, the issue of, of, of corruption in, in, in a broader way. Sense. It means that everyone should be watching over everyone. So it doesn't have to be the work of one uh, uh, government agency, which cannot probably uh, do the work uh, in a very effective way. So it has to be a, a coordinated a channel of people who uh, will be looking at, at this issue. And also, we, we talked about uh, the independence of institutions. So one of one of the problems the director of accountability has just mentioned. So we, we thought if we have institutions which are independent, working independently from one, uh, from one another, the, it's, it's going to encourage uh, to pursue cases in a, in, in a sense that those who are held accountable can be held accountable because of their neutrality or can be held accountable because they, they are strong institutions. But if we lack those institutions, it's going to be very difficult to have only one, people, one, one person or the uh, executive to take control of all these matters of corruption. So putting uh, those independent institutions will be a key to success uh, to address the issue of corruption. Are there others from the, <coughs> others from the corruption group that want to add to this, these presentations? 
No? Um, anything from the online community? The discussion said to have a question. Okay. Um, okay, well, I guess I'd like to open up the floor to um, the rest of us. Uh, your comments, um, suggestions um, on any of the, the three. And, and when you do make your recommendations or comments, if you could just tell us what, um, you know, what group you are, which area you're, you are making your suggestions for. So the floor is open. Yes. <laughs> um, a question from one of our online participants. How do you think that the private sector in the DRC could be strengthened even while peace is still far away? Yes. First of all, you have to ask yourself, is there any private sector? The private sector that exists is the Japanese. There is no private sector which is good for the need uh, to form, with the exception of a few uh, people. But the private sector, as per se, defined here, we don't have a private sector in the country. Pops and mom shops are just survival. Matter of survival in the Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, I just came from there and I'm returning, but uh, I can tell you that there is no private sector. We are trying to create a private sector. Mm -hmm. We need to create a private sector. That's the reason why we have problems in the, in the Congo, because there is no private sector to sustain democracy fight, demo democratic progress. If you don't have a private sector, you don't have a middle class. All the effort we're making for democracy will not will fail. These are the people who support democracy. So we don't have a private sector. We need to create one. When you talk about mining and other activities, they are held in the hands of foreigners. Just point out the issue about uh, uh, financing the private sector. Name one Congolese bank that is funding activities in the Congo. None. None. They are, first of all, subsidiaries of foreign banks. So how can you create a private sector when you don't even have your own bank? The so-called chef uh, de pan is broke. It's broke. But in Mutembo, the chef de pan is has money. But when they want to get money, they just don't want to send us that money here. It's not working. They are many, the, the, the problem in Congo are structural, and the whole thing has to be reorganized. That's my comment in regards to the private sector. Okay. Um, Mr. Alula, and then Mr. Tombilangana. Okay, uh, just to, by saying that you empty our uh, section, uh, like uh, <laughs> we didn't work on that. <laughs> we work on that subject, that's why we came with three, uh, four different groups. We just, uh, because we're talking uh, to the people who don't know, I know you master the situation in the Congo for being here and going back and forth uh, in the country. Uh, Part of your your response are true and real. I would not uh, uh, dispose of it, but uh, there is a private sector that we call the illegal illegal sector. All those mining company in the eastern, so we put them on illegal private sector group. We spoke about informal Inform business. Informal business. The what is very important when you go to Kinshasa, you will see that after every two or three parcel people are selling something outside. So uh, that was a shock for it's me, saying so many people selling, who is buying? But I, I respond to myself, but because they are selling, that means people are buying, okay? Uh, in Kinshasa, more than eight to nine million people uh, to get together in a stadium 110, it becomes just a job because uh, in the time, Kinshasa has one or two million people to have 100,000 pe uh, people in the stadium. That was a very big uh, soccer game. 
uh, Vita in Mana, Bilima, and so on, or uh, international soccer games. To get back to the private sector point, we, we, in our group, we point out all the issues that you raised. Finance, there is no source of funding to make the business to leave the informal level because people have the creativity how to bring their idea to a business. Uh, we raise also a point since the des Congolese diaspora has been investing their own money no, without any institution help or assistance to build those small business. We know that for those who are following us uh, online, we're talking about the Flats Hotel in Kinshasa. This is, those are initiatives, not our large corporates outside of the country. This is Banamboka just saying, okay, in my, in my area, we, I put uh, five or 10 room here, then if you have people coming to vacation, uh, we start using it. And uh, one thing I will also point out is very important. I have, I meet this guy in Paris. He just went back home and he found someone dying in, the, the, in their uh, area. They didn't have money to pay for the coffin. And they say, okay, go buy me some wood and everything. They, they start just improvise something to put this guy inside and bury him. When he came back in Paris, he goes to the car junk, junkyard mm -hmm. and get one old car and put in the ship and send it back home. He make it a corbia, how you call it? A, a, a hearse. A, 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 a curse. That's the starting of his business, and the business gets bigger. So Congolese are really entrepreneurs, as we say it in our group. The, the point you made is on the finance side, and this is why in our group we also point out the outside influence, because since the government uh, revenue is diverted by the war and everything, Nothing is coming to build this infrastructure or to build the, the country. This is, that was the picture of... Uh, I was uh, thinking about saying what uh, George is saying. There is informal private sector, which mm -hmm. is uh, taking almost 60% uh, of the business mm -hmm. in Congo. The problem is the weakness, the lack of uh, policy, because the uh, small informal business must be integrated in uh, some uh, microeconomics policy from the government. There is the Ministry of uh, Small uh, Enterprise or Small Business, which has attribution to transform, integrate, transform this uh, informal small business in formal business where we can talk about private sector. Uh, sector. Yeah. But that was a failure. Uh, so the problem also, there are many barriers mm -hmm. which obstacle, which can help to integrate this informal they, they were talking about lack of finance, the, the credit. Mm -hmm. The loan is uh, something uh, strange in Congo. Yeah. I'm but glad you brought that up because yeah. that's one of the recommendations. Yes, yeah. they did it. The, to, uh, to access to loan, it's a problem. But you will see there is a, a, what double standard there. Because you will see some formula who can, they don't have even any collateral, but they can access to big loan. <laughs> Do you see? That's another problem, because the guy who is providing loan is using other criteria than the uh, right one. <laughs> and also, uh, the government, he talked about this small uh, cooperative or a small uh, uh, saving uh, bank, somewhere very powerful, even in Kinshasa. The Kregil, I must uh, made good progress, but they were shut down because of the government couldn't take 
start to organization and integrate it in formal business financing process. Mm -hmm. So we can, there are many small cooperatives, the government must look at how to make them more efficient and to be also partners in uh, to buy share in these big uh, foreign bank. The foreign bank are there, but nobody is buying some share, even uh, two, five percent. So that's a problem. Okay. Um, hold on, I have six people. <laughs> um, Professor Kabamba? Yes, I, I think the private sector has been informalized. And I want to give just one example uh, where I found a very successful private sector, but which are, are presenting limitation now. And I was interested to this region because I was looking at something which is successful in this chaotic Congo. And I remember one day on Boulevard Tanjuan, around Point Sosimat, there were interaction around 1 a.m., a group of prostitutes and a young men. And one prostitute said that, it will say that in Swahili, uko munande ni kubembeleshe. Ozanande na bonde la yo. It means that, are you a munande so that I could beg you? That's to show that the reputation of the banande is these people are very successful too private sector in Northeast. They have millionaires. But the limitation is now that with this money and because of the war around, they can't, even though they have ideas, they always say that everything we bring from Dubai, China, could be produced here in Butembo. We could even start infant manufacturing industry. Here in Butembo, we have power, we have money. But the thing is, you need a big investment which is beyond the private sector. The millions are sitting in Hong Kong, but there's nothing, I mean, you need a more formal uh, organization, I mean, governments becoming really reliable so that these people could expand. You need a free way to, to bring everything they produce. So the informal sector, even if it could be successful, it have its limitation. In the level of Congo as a country, I think what we discuss here, we need a real government for people of Congo, which will exploit all these dynamics. There's no lack of entrepreneurship in the Congo. The Nandi have demonstrated. But in, in terms of the whole country, you need more formal. Informal is no longer enough, mm -hmm. what I've seen in the Congo. OK. Um. Bernard Blondoni? Yeah, just going back to maybe the question of the mm -hmm. um, There is still a problem where we have violence today, and probably my recommendation to you, if I can answer this question, that is going to get, unless we, we, we stop violence or we mm -hmm. establish a, a peace and a security environment which can attract uh, the direct foreign investment, we will not be able to uh, achieve our net progress in uh, our private sector. Like just what uh, Professor Kabanda said, if we, we, we put in place a government which works very well, not a dysfunctional government, but a government which, which really works very well for the people and which can create this sustainability uh, of peace and security. In that sense, there will be an environment where foreigners also can come and invest, not only the Congolese people, mm -hmm. but if we have an environment of peace and security, and, 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 and uh, people in, in foreign countries see that there is an opportunity in the Congo to start business, then we will, we will be able to attract, to attract those foreign in investment. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's Theo Amani, I don't know uh, many times. Um, you know, uh, there is a point that came during our discussion, and uh, we may not have agreed on it, but the idea was that, and I can see from people's interventions here, we are no longer talking about corruption and mining, mm -hmm. we are talking about private sector. <coughs> and the idea is really that uh, we have only one problem in Congo, and that's poverty. Poverty because there was no real economic infrastructure built, 
and without infrastructure and nobody seems to know where to get started. You know, people rush to the top, they want to build the, the country from top down. Uh, so we have a government, um, you know, it's like you, you have a big CEO of an empty house. You know? uh, there's nothing going on, but you, you still have a CEO. And we want to uh, like import that foreign structure, you know, because uh, France have a Ministry of Information. Well, we also need a Ministry of Information because we are, we are also a sovereign country, even if uh, he has nothing to do. So, and even those wars, um, they are fighting, you know, for government. And uh, the way we put it in my, uh, I represent a group called Bishan Abito, the way we put it is like, you know, we, we are fighting for the roof of a ghost house. The building the, the, the house would, should start with the foundation, you know, and then the uh, economic system. And the politics comes to cover and protect. But in Congo, we start with politics. It's okay to think that, you know, it's, uh, good to change the government and bring in new, better policies. But who is going to do it? That may be out of our reach. And, uh, and the, the attitude would be like, you know, uh, help me clean this house and then I come. We don't see ourselves as being the, 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 the players who, who should clean up the house. So we, we need to, my suggestion is that we need to really forget about all those problems. There are people there who are surviving, who have become millionaires, as someone said there. And business is really booming <laughs> when you go to Congo. You just don't understand how it's happening. Because we have uh, learned about structures that should exist. And we go there and we don't see those structures. And we wonder, you know, how is it happening? And I really remember back in 85, we had some specialists from the uh, European Union who came and they did a survey. And they said, according to their calculations, you know, everybody should be dead in Congo. <laughs> you know, and they were wondering, you know, how are you still alive? And, you know, because we can see people running around, selling, and, but according to our simulation here in our computers, <laughs> you know, simulation. Dead. It <laughs> so we cannot ignore what already exists. We need to build on what is there. Uh, going to the uh, base, you know, the community, uh, the lowest level, and start working with them, with the structures that already exist. Because the only problem really is economic. And uh, everything else from corruption to violence toward women to, you know, um, everything that has been discussed, you know, the sense of it is poverty. Okay. No foundation for the house. I have Mr. Mushagasha. Uh, yes, uh, before <coughs> When you were talking, something came in mind, mm -hmm. and I want to take up, up to him when he says that it's poverty which is the cause of everything. <coughs> now, my question to him, is it poverty which brought war in Congo? Because it's that war which is the cause of poverty. more poverty that we are seeing today. I think uh, having that discussion is really deviating the problem and uh, we'll never come up to a point where we'll bring a solution to the problem that we are discussing about here. The question, the online question was, can the private sector in Congo uh, improve in a, a situation of war? I think that's what we should focus on, answering to that question. And my, my answer is that no. We cannot do nothing. We cannot improve the private sector. If, even if it's informal today, there's no way for us to make it formal as long as this war is going on. Mm -hmm. Because this war, like the prof said it, the Nande are people living in North Kivu. They are being discouraged or they are being hit somewhere because of this war. But it's not only the Nande, it's a we had Kasayan, Kasa, Kasa, people from Kasai, who are very also good in business, who are billions. But today, because of war, 
we, for, we saw that everything came down. And we know that the government that we have today is a government which is a result, who, which has been created by those who have sponsored this war. So it's a government which is there just to continue doing, to continue con the cycle of, of poverty which is there. So I think the man who has answered the question online, we should find a solution for him, an answer for him. And my, me, my answer to him is that in this situation of war, of crisis, the private uh, the sector will never improve in Congo. Those who are continuing, who, who are having money in private sector, are those who are connected to the government. And that multiplies again the corruption. Because you need to be either a friend or a relative to a general for you to do business. You need to be either a friend or a relative to a minister for you to do business. And then from outside, you, we will see that things are going very well. But if you go inside, you dig, in, you dig really, you find that there is a connection that all people don't have. Can I respond quickly? Um, just very quickly, because I want yes. to get through the list. Are you just responding directly? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Um, I think, you know, we, there are two attitudes we can have. We can decide to be victims, you know, build this situation, and we can just sit down the, the rest of our lives and do nothing like waiting mm -hmm. for things to improve before we can do something. Or we can decide that, you know, we, we need to be uh, positive players and see how we can intervene to change the situation. Because mm -hmm. we can really go there and connect with the base and work with them. They are the real power, you know? Um, but if we are not there, we leave that vacuum. Politicians come and, and use it. And many other players, you know, outside players, because we are not there. Okay, I have David um, Ellison. Hi. Hi. Hi, David Ellison. I lived in Chicago many years ago, more than I care to remember. And um, I run a little blog site called Congo Resources. Um, and so I've been interested in Congo for 20 plus years. Um, I, I want to bring this discussion back a little bit to specifically the diaspora. And I want to begin by just asking some, some very basic questions. Do we know how big it is? Do we know where it's located? Do we know how well educated it is? Um, we know where it's located. Um, and I think it's uh, a very good exercise would be to find out as much as we can about that. Because you, you may discover that there are, in fact, some things that you can do as members of the diaspora, specifically vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US government. For example, if you find out that many, many Congolese live in two or three uh, uh, specific locales, you may be able to organize yourselves in a way that you can then go to US uh, your US representative, your congressional rep representative, and say, listen, there are 500 of us dual citizens who live in your district, and we care about this, and we would like you to do X or Y or Z. <coughs> and you'll be surprised at how willing the congressman will be to, or congresswoman will be to listen to you. Um, I think another thing that you can do specifically that would be helpful is to act as sort of translators and interlocutors between NGOs working on the ground on the issues you care about and agencies and groups in the US who fund, who are interested in funding these kind of groups. So that, for example, if you have, if you know of uh, an NGO working on exposing corruption, um, in the government. Well, you can sort of introduce that group and find out about that group and then go to groups here in the US like the Rockefeller Foundation and other foundations, perhaps even the US Institute of Peace, and ask them, say, listen, we have this group that's been doing good work, but it really needs $10,000, $20,000. Can you help us? And so as ambassadors, as translators, that's another role that you can specifically play. And then finally, uh, I mean, look at the example of Liberia. Um, 
here you had someone who, who was, in fact, a member of the diaspora who became president of the country um, and who brought her technocratic skills to back to Liberia. Um, I think there, there's, I understand the sense that Kabila is a very powerful man and that he's likely to do everything he can to fix the elections. He controls the repressive, he controls uh, the media, he, uh, he controls the money, but the fact is that he doesn't control the eastern part of the country anymore. He's not going to get those votes, right, <coughs> that he got in, in 2007. Um, he's, not, he's certainly not going to win the votes in the, e in the east. So I think he's much more vulnerable than you think, and I think that the diaspora can play a very important role in, if, if they organize, if they unite, and if they uh, lend their voice and their money to opposition forces within the Congo. So I'll leave it there. Okay, I have, um, I have four people that's re remaining on the list. And what I'd like to do is um, get through these four people and then work on our recommendations. Okay, so next on my list is Mvemba. Um, I'm Vemba. I just want to say a couple of things, actually. One, we need to avoid holding Congo hostage to the war zone. Congo is bigger than the Eastern Corridor where the war is. Most of the provinces don't have war. So there's, a sec there's an entire area where mining, I mean, uh, business should be promoted. So we talk in terms of Bukavu, Ituri. One, those, countries, those places actually, the economy is doing okay. If you consider them in the case of Congo, Bukavu is much more progressive and doing well as compared Bandu. to Bandundu, to Mandaka. So there's a war economy that is actually boom. Uh, there's new hotels springing all over the place. The cost of living, it's more expensive in Bukavu, it's like living in DC. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna rent a room at the Mount Kawizi, it costs you about $80 a night. Mm -hmm. NGOs, so the economy is not suffering. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear here. People are suffering, there's rape, there's all kinds of things, but the economy in Bukavu or Bigoma it's amazing. You find homes like you were in Potomac. It puts you to shame. It puts me to shame as a member of diaspora. My diploma don't amount to anything <laughs> when I'm down there. That's one. Two, uh, as far as private sector, there's something that just came back to me. There's an, there's an institution called Sohide. Sohide was the backbone of the private enterprise, the small and medium enterprises in, in Congo for a long time. Uh, shareholders including the IFC, the Agence de Development Française, and all of that. In the early 90s, this company decided to pull out of Congo under the guise of punishing Mobutu. And you're familiar with this Ambar Abdul type of regime. But once Mobutu was out, nobody went back to his base. I was in Kinshasa trying to promote Sofide. Sofide is a pipeline of $180 million. These are the requests they get from the various businesses around the country, Congolese businesses. Uh, groups like the IFC, Women and other groups should be pushed, reminded that they were at one time shareholders in this, con this institution. They should go back. It is that in the institution that will pump, if you will, the small businesses that have been struggling because the infrastructure is there. So we should not try always to reinvent the wheel. Most of Congo is free, it's open for business. Institution, at least skeletal institution, is out there that we should. So that's mm -hmm. all. Um, then I have Agnes, uh, yes, Dimandia. Uh, Agnes, Dimandia, what I need to translate. Uh, the situation in Congo is very much in the Congo is hurting because Quand vous regardez d'un côté les potentialités énormes de ce pays, when you look at one side the potential of that country, il n'y a pas que les mines. It's, only, it's not only mining. Il y a d'autres potentialités, d'autres possibilités qui existent. And there are other potentialities and uh, possibilities that exist. Et d'un autre côté, vous avez le capital humain. And the other, on the other side, you have a human uh, capital. 
Et comme tout le monde l'a reconnu, les Congolais ne manquent pas d'entrepreneuriat. Yes, everybody recognizes it. The Congolese uh, uh, don't lack uh, entrepreneurial skills. Alors, il y a quelque chose de malsain. Something is wrong. Il y a une pauvreté entretenue quelque part. There is a, a cycle of poverty that is uh, sustained somewhere. Il y a entretenu, voulu. And maintained and desired. Et quand on a parlé ici, on a oublié de mettre en exergue le rôle de l'Union européenne, les pays de membres de l'Union européenne. And as we spoke here, we forgot to uh, point out the role that the European Union, the countries of the member of the European Union, have played. Presque tous ces pays là, tous les pays de l'Union européenne sont impliqués dans les pillages. Most of these countries are implicated in the pillaging of the country. Et nous avons parlé de la constitution, nous avons parlé du code de minier et tout, tout est parti d'eux. The mining code, it, they started, they made, mm -hmm. they made them. Et ils, ils entretiennent cette pauvreté du peuple congolais pour mieux les manipuler and et they, en faire ce qu'ils veulent. They are maintaining this uh, cycle of poverty of the Congolese people so they can manipulate them and um, do whatever they want. Le Congo ne mérite pas d'être ce qu'il est aujourd'hui, ni le peuple congolais d'atteindre un tel niveau de pauvreté. Non. Congo does not deserve this uh, kind of uh, situation it, in, in which it found itself, as well as the Congolese people don't deserve this kind of uh, treatment. Okay. Before you, oh, no, you're next, and then Nita. Well, okay. I may have been harsh in saying that uh, there is no private sector in the Congo. Uh, uh, bear in mind that there have been some uh, vibrant entrepreneurs in, in the Congo. And, but I wanted to point out the fact that uh, when the country is not uh, well governed, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, the fish start by working from the head, not from the, the tail. Um, Demba mentioned some of the regions that uh, are open for business. Is, uh, I'm in Kinshasa, I'm in Kumbashi, Mushimai. So <laughs> today Mushimai is on its knees. Why? Because Miba, mm -hmm. the, the diamond producing uh, company, all the money was taken by the government to finance the war. Now, the government does not come up with money to relaunch the, the company. Yes, there was some mismanagement, but the one who took the money of MIBA is the government. 160 million was taken to finance the war. Uh, he mentioned about Sophie Day. Sophie Day today, uh, the managing director and classmate of mine at university, had to go to China to ask for money. So Chinese are coming to fund uh, Sophie Day because the West do not finance Sophie Day. So that's one of the aspects of bringing Chinese in the Congo. And they are already there. You, 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 you will be surprised. In Lubumbashi, there was just one Chinese restaurant. Now there are six. And they are just coming because Chinese are coming in the Congo. Yes, Congolese are entrepreneurs. Congolese are on the level of survival. The Professor uh, Kabamba mentioned the fact that uh, uh, Nandis have been making uh, money and they are not investing. They are investing in Hong Kong. They are buying real estate in Kinshasa because they are no more secure in Goma. In, uh, in the, they feel like everything will be destroyed. Pai Pai lost uh, how much? Uh, all his farm. No. He lost everything. There are so many examples that can be given of people who had invested but have lost their, uh, their okay. property. When you come to Katanga, everybody will say, oh, Katanga is booming, Katanga is booming. Tell me how many jobs have been created, created in Katanga. So you can say that there is change coming because the country is at peace. Most of the money goes into the pockets of some few. 
When Je Kamin was given money by the Chinese to start, the money was gone. He will go to Je Kamin. That's why Je Kamin today is also again unable to pay its personnel. The issue of voting in Congo is real. And as uh, the blogger uh, mentioned, the diaspora can be the one that can save Congo if they speak one voice. And if they focus on what is necessary for the people of Congo. Right now, what we need in Congo is a good, competent government with laws that we can define to work, make the country move forward. Critical that we address this issue. And if we don't, we're going to be in turning in circles for nothing. That's my short comment. Okay, I have um, Nita and Intel, and I, I think after that, I want to move to recommendations. And very brief, and then. about the investor from uh, the international investors because if Congo become one of the the, the, um, um, the place where people can invest and their, their um, uh, interest is protected I'm sure we're gonna have those investors international investors be part be our ally to push about peace in the Congo the reason why they're not doing that is because right now we don't have very much serious company doing business in Congo because the the, the risk are too high and um, and that's why we're having those Explorer, people who really take big risks to invest in Congo instead of very, very serious company that could actually help bring peace in many of those um, areas in the Congo. Okay, Intel, and then you have the last word. Okay. Um, just a quick, I mean, uh, quick couple of points. The first one is that uh, when we're looking at the issue of the diaspora getting involved, what I call the reconstruction of you know the, the BRC. You know, I always want to call us to one point and say, you know, as we consider what we think we're capable of doing, we need, I mean, we are required to also look at the perception of the locals vis-a-vis -vis us. How do they perceive us? What do they think? I mean, because in the end, we're going to have to work with those who are there. And so far, like it or not, the perception of the diaspora working with us is a negative one. What I know for sure is that they look at those who have come before us and what they have done. And they, they point and say, see, the second thing that they look at is, you know, uh, how much have we been able to accomplish where we live? And if we have nothing to show for, right, then they ask, so what do you think you're going to be able to, you know, to do here? And there comes that call for maybe being organized, mm -hmm. the unity here. We have to be mindful of the fact that if we act like, you know, uh, some, you know, uh, spoiled brats, some complainers, some victims, etc., that is what is being heard, and that's the perception, you know, against which we're going to start working. Um, the the next point is that of saying it's incumbent upon us as we we see what we're going to do. I feel sorry sometimes sometime when I hear somebody talking about doing business in the Congo, and they are talking about doing the, you know, the pop and mom shop that somebody in the Congo is already doing. Mm -hmm. And my thing becomes, if you come with the mighty dollar to sort of take the business away from those who are doing that already and contributing to more poverty of it, I say there's really a poverty of what I'll say, uh, the mentor in us. Can we think big? 
Can we think about something that is going to be at a national level? Can we think of some? Those are the points that, you know, for me, at this particular point, I like to, point on the, to put on the floor. Because sometimes, the, you know, uh, I wonder, you know, what we think of ourselves as being motors of that development back home. Last word. Okay, uh, I have a question on, uh, I think a recommendation on uh, corruption. You said, you said how is it uh, unsolved, but I didn't see from the group. I don't know if uh, I forgot. I missed it. I didn't see talking about uh, zero tolerance in Congo, in Congo means what? Start, implement all audit reports who are there because people who were being corrupted, these who are mismanaged, the public funds, they are there. Reports are there from a good account, from a, uh, what uh, general inspection of finance and. Uh, all auditing uh, institution, look at it. Can we start from there? Because these people are running institution in Congo. So tomorrow, when you put a new institution, they will be different. How can you enforce the law if you don't start by looking at uh, some report recent? Lutungula Commission, uh, the Parliament Commission, they have all reports there with names, what has been done. Just the little boy or the little people, as you say, are taken. But the big, he talked about mining. The guy who was running me back, ran away with, with what? Millions of dollars. Today, I think he has been appointed ambassador somewhere. Can you believe where is the author? I think you start from the recommendation already. Yes. Okay. So. Um, oh, sorry. If, uh, <laughs> let me just. Um, I've just. I've been taking notes. Um, let me just point out some of the things that have come out as recommendations, and we can move forward on that. Uh, first, is there anything? Any pass me a note, but is there? Um, one question from the online group is: Are are we going to be pointing out specific ways um, to denounce, well, they're very specific, to denounce corruption in the US. And, but I think that we can think of, when we're formulating our recommendations, think, think in terms of um, specificity. So this, this question um, can also apply to um, the other two areas. Some of the things that, that you all have mentioned in terms of proposed actions, forming networks that's come up in a variety of ways. Um, understanding who the diaspora are and who they represent um, in terms of understanding your own uh, power. Uh, forming networks to invest in Congo. The need to build on existing structures. Uh, using the diaspora to lead discussions or ideas for development. I'm just summarizing uh, what you said, Intel. And lastly, um, what uh, Mr. Antoine Langana was just talking about, the diaspora needs to make use of existing reports and, and information. So those are just some of the things that you have been mentioning throughout um, the discussion. But um, you know, how, going forward, what types of actions would you um, propose? Yes. Yeah, um, my name is Jean Mayaka. Um, about the corruption, you will notice that in Congo, the corruption is everywhere. So whatever um, the people who intervened before me said is a real problem. But the Congolese are people that originally are ready for a change. I'm going to give you a single example. When Chisekedi, Etienne Chisekedi when up, was appointed prime minister. Everyone knowing that Chisekedi is someone who can work. Everyone changed, over, changed overnight. Right. 
For example, all, all people who were stealing government cars, mm -hmm. overnight they returned all cars in the, 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 what do you call, the Congress, in, in, in front of the Congress uh, building. At morning time, you can count how many mi million, I mean, hundreds of cars returned. And in the market, whoever was raising the price at will was able to bring the, 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 the price of bread, little, little bread from 20 Zaire, whatever, to 10, or uh, whichever better, um, at the, 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 the correct level at the gas station, the same thing. That means what? Congolese can change, and they are ready for a change. But what we putting there is um, um, tools to bring them change. Nothing so far. Uh, I'm gonna give my uh, practical uh, suggestion. If today diaspora in uh, wherever uh, France, Con uh, United States from Congo decide to put in place a national ser service or institution against corruption and seek help from uh, the USA um, international organization to support them and uh, help them um, work in secure place in Congo or abroad. Would you be able to help us? Because this is the, the forum or colloquium for diaspora. We are giving, um, we are giving to you information about whatever is happening to the Congo. What we're giving here, you can read it everywhere at the newspaper website, it's there. There is nothing new we, we bring in today. But what can we bring? For example, I'm suggesting the creation of national institution against corruption. If it is there, it's watching on everyone. From the small uh, person to the, the government, Three weeks, one month after that, you will see that change will happen in the Congo. But if it happens, give appropriate uh, protection to that organization, and you will see will, a thing will happen. Um, if I have something else, I will uh, ask <laughs> later if uh, I can. We brought together civil society for six countries, from six countries. and. There was uh, a creation of the Observatoire de, de Lutte contre la Corruption en Afrique Centrale. Okay. That institution had structures and everything. And this is, you know, the civil society, you know, uh, going at it. When we were in the meeting earlier, I said, we have some lights of integrity back in the country that's working. You'll be surprised that the president of that institution is a Congolese, and that the branch of that institution is working in the Congo. Mm -hmm. So the point here for me is not that you know those institutions don't exist. Yeah. The point becomes in which environment are they working? We're working here in an environment where, I mean, I guess I, I keep saying it, if you have weak governance and you try to do a surgical intervention against you know, corruption, you're doomed to fail. It's a systemic, how can I say, uh, there's a systemic relationship between all the things that go on with, within you know, a society. And unless we take it that way, unless we think that the creation of just an institution is going to be, you know, the solution, then we're not taking into account what uh, Mama uh, Dimanja talked about, that we're not taking into account the human capital that we have in the Congo, and that's where, according to me, we should put our efforts. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Kabamba? Just a short comment and answer the question mm -hmm. uh, asked the question about the number of people that In Atlanta, they talk about more than 2,000 people living there. And 
most of them uh, live on small plants. And they are all educated in Congo, but they didn't convert uh, to live here. So it's not actually, uh, so, but now there is a need to go back to college. And you can see many of the people I know are going back to college. talk about the controversial figure in Southern Africa, Mugabe. Mugabe in the 80s did a land reform, which worked very well, but it was done with the concentrating all other elites. They put all the brains together to think how to improve Zimbabwe. In the 80s, Mugabe's land reform was a success. But the second he did, because of his political influence, that where all the elites went to power, was a fiasco. So what I would recommend, uh, my demand is for this now, to have kind of a consensus of diaspora of elite, local elite, uh, intellectual elite, what do you want to do for the country? And try to find uh, this consensus and then go ahead. I think it's possible. It's just a starting point. It's uh, one of the recommendations. Okay. Um, Mr. Is it Amani? Amani, yes. Yeah. Uh, there is one recommendation that came uh, out of our group, and that uh, was not underlined, and I would like to come back to it. Uh, because we have many people who have very good ideas, uh, who are interested in you know, starting small businesses. That's what we want to promote in Congo. Uh, but sometimes they don't have access to information. And we we're thinking, we we're uh, suggesting that uh, the same way you organize this panel uh, discussion, that um, we can organize another symposium, another conference, and invite uh, key players in uh, the financial market, people who fund development, and uh, we can call upon uh, you know people who want to do business and uh, to come with their plans and have like a workshop and uh, connect people with money. Okay, Mr. Alula. Okay, uh, I know that uh, we're getting to the end, and this is uh, maybe also the time for uh, us. Um, just uh, forgive me for those who don't recognize uh, themselves for, for what I will say. Uh, I'm really grateful for the organization of uh, this day and this event on behalf of the Congolese uh, diaspora, uh, because it was uh, for the first time, I think, here in the U.S., uh, giving this opportunity to bring Congolese together and share with those who love the Congo from their experience. We spend a very, very interesting time together and uh, I think we're getting somehow in a different view. Uh, we, in the Congolese diaspora, some of, some of us didn't know each other. So people came from New York and from Atlanta and from uh, a different area of the region. So just not to miss this opportunity to say thank you to the United States Institute of Peace for having this idea and also binding you for the future. Just uh, uh, think that we didn't waste our time today. We work hard to get there and uh, we want uh, this be the first step and go further. Go further is to see action, uh, one or two action coming out of so many ideas that we may have uh, managed today and uh, this is what I want to say and uh, the last thing is that sometimes every time that we're talking about the Congolese diaspora or the intellectual Congolese I feel like we go always on making our actually to ourselves we did a lot positive thing that's why uh, what you say this country didn't disappear so the Congolese diaspora helped a lot just to keep the, the country afloat not uh, uh, going further down just to keep it afloat and we need now that the international community take bring us back <coughs> the Congo bring the Congo back to the Congolese people we will keep or restore the peace in the Great Lake region with our brother of the eastern or the western side of or north or south uh, part of our country we just need uh, to send this peace me message 
since we are in the Institute of Peace, and uh, let the people that we are ready to deliver. Congo is the supplier of the world high-tech raw material. We need to behave like a supplier to, to create a direct link between the market and we as the supplier. That will change the, 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 the view and respond, solve many of the problems that we raise today and we try to solve. This is my last word. I thank you so much for giving me just the word up to the end of this word. Thank you. Thank you. Just a second, uh, Mr. Uh, and then Mr. Mandela. Mandela. Uh, I wanted just to go back to the agenda of the day. We have to link mining, uh, mining from the world to communism. What have you suggest uh, that uh, we pursue this uh, to get those who are acting in the exploitation of illicit mining out of the Congo, meaning Rwanda and Uganda, including all the surveys? essential to bring peace. Second, to make sure that you want to identify where the, the mines are, uh, the, the materials are coming from, just build some uh, uh, revitalize or revive the mining uh, plant or companies that existed in those areas so we can identify where the material is coming from. So these are critical issues because if we don't stop that, as uh, someone pointed out in the discussion, the CNDP is still controlling some mining areas, which means this area, identification of Rwanda, is still going the flow of businesses. So we must stop that by making sure that the administration here tells Rwanda and Uganda without any, uh, any uh, doubt or when they must be firm and make sure that they are Strengthening the private sector, yes, the private sector has to be created. We are doing currently a study on uh, financial intermediation in the Congo, and uh, you will have the, the results uh, sometimes uh, in, uh, in December. Who is we? My group. My group is the Foundation for Competency, Integrity, and Good Governance in the Congo. All right? We have the foundation, we are doing that. And I can tell you things we, we know about the financial sector will uh, amaze you. We are doing things for the Congo, not for self-enrichment or whatever. And this is what I would like the Congolese who are here to understand. If you love Congo, do something for Congo. Don't do because you come from uh, uh, which provinces, whatever. Do it for the Congo. So defend Congo with your heart, your soul, and your mind. And that's how we can get Congo back. When you talk about uh, uh, zero tolerance, Mr. Bouy uh, has tried to, to say that there has, uh, there has been some studies done in the Congo, uh, inquiries and things such as that. And I point out through a phrase here saying that when the, the, the fish rot from the head, not from the tail. It's difficult to have good governance or to have a leader who is corrupt to lead the country. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know if the ambassador uh, mentioned a story about the Ukraine that he will tell us. Uh, that's a very interesting one. Uh, it's really something very difficult to, to, to take into Congo. Uh, people are not paid. Even the least of salary they are not paid. So when you have five, six children to send to school, and your earning is about $50, but you spend three, four months without getting even one month of salary, what do you expect from that person when he sees you coming, pompous, well fed, and coming and say, I'm going to do business in Congo. <laughs> How will that person react? <laughs> you come to do business? Do business with me. Let me eat, and then you go do business. But you, you fed him. His boss didn't eat. His boss said, so you, you ate, and I didn't eat. Ah, 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 I have to eat too. So this is the situation. I make it a joke. You have to understand that until we correct this thing. When Mobutu took power, 
given by the U.S. money to control the army. That money really put the military behind on it. We are not asking you to, no, 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 excuse me. Don't take my thought away. <laughs> we are not asking you, as some people will say here, interfere. But for the human cause, the human cause that we are uh, living in the Congo, the human class we are living in the Congo, I wish the U.S. would intervene right now because we don't have a functioning civil service. The civil service are not paid. If today you take money like the USAID has done to give money for the magistrates and all these people to pay, to reinforce the the judicial system. It's a good thing, but you are just touching one aspect. But it's not even done comp uh, properly because in reaction, the government bought them cars. And you see, <laughs> there's a car, and you give him a car, you come with your, 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 your problem and say, did you buy gas for me? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess, it's a mess. You're doing things by, I mean, not solving the whole problem. It's a holistic issue that we have. So we have to look into all these aspects and say, how do we want to get Congo back on track? The security and civil service. Those are two issues we want that, that you, you need to help us uh, work on. Because we're going to election in 2011. And I can assure you, this election Going to be, are going to be a major problem. Because if we don't prepare them correctly, all this we are doing here is going to be again in trap. So, what are we asking for? We are asking for you to sit down and to say, I'm not going to be here, the speaker of God, don't send my picture and say, I said this. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're laughing, but today here I'm dead. I was so sure one time I went jogging and they went to my hotel room to find if I was dead. Sorry, I got your picture. <laughs> you know the foundation. I'll put you in the trash. <laughs> Uh, the blogger, and I didn't get his name, mentioned one crystal. David. <laughs> In the East today, Mr. Kabila, he supports his wine. In the West, he's doubtful. In Katanga, he's shaking. Now, who will stand and come and campaign? <laughs> 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 Hold on. <laughs> and have the same right as Kabila, meaning money, security, mm -hmm. uh, access to, to media. Who will have these three things in his hand to compete against Kabila? It's not lack of candidate. It's my friend George. He's a candidate. But they have a base. That's the question. I can look at around here, so many people who, who are competent that can be candidates in the Congo for whatever position they seek to, 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 to apply for. But will they have the freedom and the capacity, the means to do it freely? Because last time, we had the European Union with the military forcing us into the election. Next time, what are we going to have? China. If, oh, China is there. <laughs> yeah. China is there. Yeah. China doesn't have scruples. They come and do business. So if this change that we are discussing here, these changes we are discussing here, have to be implemented, we must
level, same level of confidence, same, same level, uh, playing level for the candidate who will participate, who wants to compete for this election. This way we can get ahead and get a change and get the same goal. And I, I think we, that's a good place to end. I want to, we have one more person, Madame Ngonda. Oh, I'm sorry? Um, and you will have the last word, yeah, I, the last I, recommendation. I just want to listen, that's very interesting. I want to just say to everybody, I'm new in DC, and um, I've been living in Miami, Florida for 18 years. And um, I see that we are all Congolese, and we are very concerned about our country. No matter how long we go, we're still looking back in Congo, and we want to see how we can improve. And um, the one thing I noticed coming here, my husband and I and my kids, um, coming from Florida, Miami, especially where Cuban and uh, people from South America are really the main frame of Florida, no matter what you say, if you don't speak Spanish over there, you're nothing. And uh, I think the one thing you were asking is, I see so many Congolese, so how many Congolese are here and who organized what, who does what? And nobody can give us an answer. And I was looking and I'm like, okay, we want people in Congo to change because we don't like this, we don't think this is right, this is corruption, name it. But here, I don't see a structure that people in Congo can look up to and say, oh yeah, you see what they're doing over there? I think they can offer us something. But I come here and I see people are very divided. We see one another once in a while and then I don't see any connection. I was asking Dave to say, does anybody know any lawyer? I think when you live in America, a friend of mine used to say, you need to know three people. You need to know a lawyer, you need to know a doctor, you need to know a mechanic. And basically that's true. now. We come here, in Miami, I can tell you, you can see this doctor, you can see this lawyer, you can see this mechanic. Mm -hmm. We enjoy having that networking that I don't see in the diaspora. It's not a critic, it's a suggestion that we need to organize here as one unit and to be able to get that unit here to the government here and then we can maybe have more impact towards what's going on in Congo because um, if 10 people come to, to the same person for the same subject, <coughs> after one, two, three, okay, why do we have 10 people for the same problem? Why don't we have one person represent the problem that we have because we are united. That person is representing all of, all of us and speaking about the problem and this is what you suggest. But if we go like I see it, it's a little bit difficult because it, it, it doesn't seem organized. That's that's what I see. So I think people need to work on that part of organizing the community and know who's who. And like uh, David, I think, suggested, who has what degree? I have no idea. I see a lot of people, I don't even know what they do. Or We talk five minutes and it's gone. So I think that's something we should look into here first before we even go talk. Okay. So well, thank you, and we we really need to wrap it up. <laughs> you can maybe that's the beginning of a network. So um, I thank you all for these recommendations. I'm going to turn it over to Raymond or Bill, Ambassador Taylor. Okay. It's been great for me. Raymond has done an amazing job of, of summarizing this. Um, and and uh, so let, let me just go through some of the things that he has seen, and I've added a couple things here as well based on my observations. Um, um, and the first is that the DRC diaspora individuals represented here in communities have voluntary, voluntarily participated in this event. And 
come together on your own and it's been, uh, it's been very productive. Special thanks to the live participants um, from three continents um, and special thanks to our people who have funneled these, uh, these live participants into us from the United States, from Europe and, and from Asia. Um, we do have discussed strategic issues related to state building in the DRC, a very important component that's come through in all, or certainly in all three uh, committees, all three working groups, breakout groups, but also in individual comments, the importance of state building. Um, and of course, mining, private sector, and corruption were the three. I want to congratulate the participants for their thoughtful and constructive interventions. Um, I also want to congratulate our three kind of rapporteurs here. I am always, as I was going from, from group to group, I was listening to part here and part there, and I was thinking, my golly, if I had to summarize what uh, was going on, <laughs> I could never do it. But that they have distilled from a rich mix of ideas and proposals into a very coherent uh, set of, uh, of summary points. So I think you all have done a Job and well, I need, to, I need to give credit to, to uh, for my group. Of, of, uh, I'm sorry. What's what's your name? Jill. Jill. <laughs> a lot for of having a part well, of it. And then, and then exactly as you say, others have contributed to your to your summary. So uh, I thought that was very good. Um, on the mining, um, there are interesting uh, issues that come out here. Uh, first of all, very clearly, um, external influences must be controlled, um, and we heard this loud and clear. Um, all the legal forces and their proxies uh, must be removed. And I heard a couple times about the possibility of a U.S. government role in that, in that demand, as, as, as you have said. Uh, mining companies should create more employment and transfer skills, technology skills, capacity building um, from, from the expat uh, into the, the national. The international community must be more forceful in sanctioning, sanctioning illegal business transactions. And again, there's the possibility for a U.S. government role, um, which we ought, to, uh, we ought to consider. I'll come back to that. Uh, the, the private sector discussion. Uh, policy should target the different types of the private sector entities. And you all went through um, in some, uh, some very uh, well thought out way, the formal, the informal, the illegal, and the peristegal components of this. That, that was a useful way of organizing what kinds of things, what kinds of recommendations. Taxation and registration uh, policies must be improved. Transparency should also be enhanced. Um, infrastructure and services must be upgraded for the private sector. Uh, they must be accessible and affordable. Practical workshops should be held with donor agencies and corporations to, to push those ideas. On the corruption, a very interesting one, and I, uh, I did uh, mention to several people at lunch, whenever I, as an American, talk about corruption anywhere else other than the United States, and I've been in, uh, I've been in Ukraine for three years, and so I've had an opportunity to talk about corruption in Ukraine, um, because it has a big problem with corruption. But whenever I talk about this, I preface it with the observation that, first of all, all countries in the world have this problem. This is not a problem uh, unique uh, to any country in the world. It is common throughout the world. It's not a, it's not a national characteristic. It is a human characteristic, I think, that is, is the problem. Uh, some societies and some institutions will enable it more than others. Um, but whenever I talk about this, I, I note that you can pick up any newspaper, local newspaper, um, national newspaper in the United States, any day of the week, and you will find stories in there about corrupt mayors and governors and, and congressmen, and, and you will find stories about how they're taken to trial and, and convicted and put in jail. Uh, and when I talk to my Ukrainian colleagues about this, my Ukrainian friends, and I point out that uh, you know, we have a uh, senator from Alaska who is uh, convicted of bribery, and we have a governor of Illinois who, was, uh, who either has been or will be convicted of uh, selling Senator Obama's seat. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and I point out that to my Ukrainian friends that um, the difference between Ukraine and the United States is we, is not that we have difference in corruption. We both countries have corrupt pro corruption uh, problems with our, with our politicians. But the difference is we track them down yeah. and we take them to trial and we put them in jail. And just to, this doesn't really relate to the, this meeting, but it's an interesting uh, point that I, that I finish up 
up with my Ukrainian colleagues and I tell them uh, that uh, there is only one high-level Ukrainian who is in jail. Uh, there is a prime minister, a former prime minister, Lazarenko, who is in jail, and he's in jail in California. Uh, not in jail in, in Ukraine. Uh, we, we found him guilty and we stuck him in jail. They need to do that. The Ukrainians need yeah. to do that. that that's, that's really important if you're going to crack down on corruption. So, corruption. Um, corruption, and back to our groups here. Corruption must be denounced inside and outside the DRC. Laws must be enforced dispassionately. Implement transparency and accountability measures. Nepotism must be addressed, <coughs> particularly with reference to credit allocation. Um, I would also say, I, uh, this was raised in the corruption uh, group, I wasn't there for it, but one of the big things, the way to fight corruption is, a, is an aggressive independent media. If you can shine light um, on corrupt practices and not get killed, um, <laughs> then you are going, you're taking a big step toward, toward uh, uh, wiping this out. There's a general point I thought across all three of your, of your working groups, and that is the importance of governance. Um, improving the governance, to uh, strengthen the good governance of the state. Um, uh, and, and competent, good government for the people of Congo. Um, and fair and transparent elections are certainly a part of that. Okay, um, what role for the diaspora? Now, I'm very glad that you raised this question. Um, um, you can provide more active and vocal um, uh, feedback um, on the issues. Uh, collaborate on investments uh, that we, we talked about. Collective investments to, for investing uh, in the DRC. Provide intellectual capital for policy development and uh, contribute to monitoring and evaluation um, of these. Be available to provide technical assistance when asked or required. Lobby uh, lawmakers in both the United States and Europe. Um, serve as intermediaries between business communities in the DRC and outside investors. Um, transfer skills, mentioned that earlier. Build on existing structures and initiatives. Think big. Um, make strategic investments. Uh, and then be part of the solution. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that's, uh, that's an important uh, part that you have here. Next steps, um, and Raymond was writing this down even as you were finishing up. Report, uh, we will do a report of this discussion here today. I say we, uh, Raymond and team. <laughs> we'll, we'll report on this, on this dialogue, and we'll distribute this wisely and strategically to the key players, including players in this room. Um, there could be follow-on meetings to this, so that it's not just one shot. We can do, we can have subsequent discussions, but they must be demand-driven. That is, we have, we want to respond to your requests or your suggestions, your ideas um, for for these for the follow-on meetings. As I mentioned at the outset, we will brief uh, senior U.S. and DRC officials um, on the outcome of this discussion based on this report, which you all will have seen. Uh, so the diaspora can be an effective network, and this is, I think, a great idea, and I hope there have been some beginnings of that network here today, um, and we would be glad to help. Uh, but again, I want to thank you all very much for, uh, for your work, and thanks to our folks on the, on the blogs and the people who put together the lunch. Um, mm -hmm. And I will turn it back over to Raymond, who uh, is ultimately responsible for this. <laughs> yeah, I'd also like to uh, uh, echo um, Ambassador Taylor's thanks to you all for participating in this. And the only thing I would add is that this is the start of a discussion. I hope, we, I hope it's not the end of the discussion. We've only um, touched the surface of a lot of the issues we discussed. And I believe that if we're going to be, as a body and as individuals, more useful to ongoing processes, more creative and more supportive to the development of the DRC, uh, we're going to have to work together a lot more. And uh, here at CSIP, we're more than, we're more than happy to provide a forum, forum a like this to help connect you with the um, uh, institutions and agencies that you have outlined that might be useful in supporting your efforts. And just uh, having a um, you know, brainstorming session like this, I think, would, would, would be good. So you know how to reach us. Um, there's just two last things. We have a sign-in sheet. We have all of your names, but not all of your contact details. If you don't wish for us to have your contact details or know your institutional affiliation, that's okay. But for people who would like to stay in touch, 
and know what we are planning and know how uh, this work is progressing, please make sure you um, uh, see Michelle and make sure she has your contact details when it all gets started. And last, uh, inviting you please for a few people who are watching by live video stream, thank you for joining us and thank you very much for all the great work you've done. Just uh, this morning I thanked a lot of people and like once more to thank uh, all our collaborators um, Dorina has been um, a backbone of this um, of this enterprise, and we, we, we just do not see you. I was his hand, a videographer who's behind the camera. And thank you very much for coming in, and thanks to our Chic Restaurant for providing um, uh, lunch. And on that note, going back to Dorina, last word. Well, on that note, I just want to um, thank you all for taking time out of your day. Um, to come here. Um, we appreciate the feedback, like Raymond said. We hope it's not um, a one-off, but it should be sort of something that, you know, the diaspora as a group wants, and we are more than happy to facilitate more of these um, sessions to discuss the many other issues um, affecting Congo and trying to think of the way forward. Uh, so with that, uh, but Sasha, you wanted to you want to say one, something? Yeah, one thing to add also, uh, in terms of follow up, there's a uh, there's now I would say uh, as someone who works a lot with policy advocacy here in Washington, there's a much greater growing interest in uh, in Congo now, uh, both in Congress and uh, the U.S. Uh, administration, um, and there is a lot of action going on right now. There is an active Senate bill on uh, Congo, it's called the Congo Conflict Minerals Act, and it's a bipartisan bill, and uh, this is something that will, we talked about, you know, holding corporations to account. This is something that's going to increase uh, transparency in the, um, in the supply chain for these conflict minerals. Uh, there'll be a House version that's introduced in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, the administration is trying to follow up on Senator, uh, excuse me, Secretary uh, Clinton's visit to Congo and trying to take up greater action in that regard. Uh, 60 Minutes uh, will be airing a uh, story on uh, the conflict gold trade coming from uh, uh, South and North Kivu, uh, and that's going to come out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so there's a lot going on, and so I hope that the next meeting, you know, we can we can see where those uh, actions are, are being taken and. and our campaign is also going to be going forward and pressing the companies and the governments, uh, and particularly the U.S. government, in taking constructive action both on the on the conflict minerals front and the and the war, um, well, helping manage the conflict in the east. So uh, we look forward to working with uh, any or all of you who are interested in working with us. Okay, great, and thanks again to our blogger for helping us with all of this. So um, please stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.